behalf of the family, I want to thank you all for coming. I'm Larry Pollock. I'm uh, Ted Ursch's uh, nephew. I'm the commander of Post 44. My uncle was commander of Post 14. And I have another member of his post here, Avi Goldman, who is also a member of Call Israel. Unfortunately, due to my uncle's uh, untimely death right before Memorial Day, we could not get a military uh, escort here to do the flag ceremony and the bugle. So we are going to give, uh, I want all the veterans, I brought some veterans, some of the veterans that are veterans don't have their hats on, that's perfectly okay, and you're uh, under the Congress's order, you can salute even without your hat on. So I want to ask all the veterans to come up here and stand in front of the casket. We're going to give, uh, <coughs> excuse me, my uncle one last salute. But I wanted to tell you a minute about his service. Um, I had uh, four uncles. Three of them were the U.S. Army. Uh, my Uncle Al is here. My Uncle Phil passed away. But uh, they all served. My Uncle Al and Teddy served in the Korean War in mass units, and they served honorably. So as uh, unfortunately we can't play taps, but we are on the way the casket out. We're going to give them a salute, and at the cemetery, we're going to give them a, a salute. But right now, I'd like to salute my uncle, a veteran of the Korean War. Attention, salute, at ease. And Avi, who is also a veteran of Post 14, would like to say a few words for Call Israel. I'm a veteran of the Israeli. Navy, and when Ted found out about it, he said, you have to join our post. And it took me a while, but he convinced me that I should be a member of his post. And his, in his honor, I'm wearing the, his, the head that he gave me. But um, I just want to tell you that to me and to many others, Ted pre represented a couple things, hope and life. When he was incarcerated and went to the Holocaust, he had hope and he created a great life. And it's his family and friend. And to me, he was a simple symbol of life. He taught many of us how to live life, how to enjoy family, enjoy friends. And that's the memory that I'll always share with people that I know and keep in my heart about Ted and his, and his wife. I told uh, one of his sons a couple minutes ago, I have great memories of a uh, couple years ago when they were with us in a beach in Lake Worth, Florida. And Ted was almost 90 years old with Judy. They were running into the water in the waves, having a great time. And from the legacy that he has, what he created and what will be part of us and a memory. Just remember, he had a great life and ta taught us how to live. Thank you.
Adonai Natan, Adonai Lachach, Yishem, Adonai Mevarach. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To bless God in the time in which we lose a loved one, precious family member, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, a precious friend is the hardest thing of all to do. With Ted's passing, there's a hole left in all of our hearts. There was a piece of us that we cannot reclaim. And we can't help but feel extraordinary sorrow. But at the same time, it is easy to bless God in this moment. When we stop and think about the extraordinary man that Ted Hirsch was, the love, the example, the inspiration that he was to family and to friends and community. Ted was a gentle giant. Gentle in that he was quiet, soft-spoken, unassuming, humble. Giant in that his heart was larger than anyone's. That he was filled with so much love for family, for friends, for a community, for anyone that he ever met. Because his life was guided by so much faith. Faith in God, in tradition. Because he was filled with such extraordinary strength and resilience, was able to fight and overcome against extraordinary odds. Ted may have been small in stature, but he was truly a giant. And our world and our lives are left so much richer for having known him, for having been touched by him, for having shared his love. We are gathered here to pay tribute to Ted, to honor him, and to say goodbye. And a number of people will be speaking and sharing reflections and memories. I want first to call upon Rabbi Benjamin Blau of Green Road Synagogue, a great rabbi and teacher and leader in our community. Ted and Judy are members of Green Road Synagogue for many, many long years and have a wonderful, loving relationship with Rabbi Blau, who will open our service with psalms and share remarks. Thank you, Rabbi Weiss. We were very honored to share him with B'nai Yashurin. I know that's where he spent most of his time. He'll elaborate later on him being one of the millionaires, regularly attending Minyan, even in his age over 90 on a daily basis. But we at Green Road were fortunate to have him as members as well, particularly Shabbos morning. And I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to first say a parak of Tilim, a chapter of Psalms, and then share a few words. We'll see, we'll read chapter 23, Perak Chavkimo. Mizmor le David, Adonai roi lo echzar, binos dasha yarbitzeni ame menuchos yina aleini. Nafshi yishovev, yanchein bimagle tzedek liman shimo, gam ki elech vegeitzal moves, 
Lowi Raraki Atoi Modi, Shiv the Gomishan Terka Hemoyana Kamuni, Taroglapanai Shoko Neget Zoriroi, Vishant of Hashem and Roshi Kosi Rivoya, Akto Vachesed Yudafuni Koyame Hayai, Vishafti Besa Donoi, the Orek Yamim. A song of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. God makes me lie down in lush pastures, God leads me through tr beside tranquil waters. God restores my soul and guides me in righteous path for God's name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your scepter and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in full view of my adversaries. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. The only goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for length of days. Ted Hirsch was really, truly an inspiration. He was a man of quiet strength and dignity. As Rabbi Weiss alluded to, he was not large in stature in a physical sense, but he was large in stature. He had an incredible strength of personality, able to persevere through the darkest moments. We read, read about walking through the valley of death. And he did, with his brothers, walk through the horrors of the Holocaust, survive, persevered, fought in the Korean War, and then built a life with Judy together, a beautiful life, as you see the family members and all the generations that he fostered. So the first part that I learned from him was how to be a strong, strong individual. We often associate strength with physical characteristics, but he had an inner strength, and it shone through in everything that he did. And the second lesson that I learned from his life was what it meant to be committed. Committed to one's country, committed to the people, the Jewish people, committed to God, and committed to his family. He was a deeply committed man in every one of those senses. Rabbi Weiss noted how much we'll miss him. I know his spot in Shul. Yibadalachayim, as we distinguish between those who have passed and those who are alive, he would come in, sit next to his good friend, Tommy Munes, and then Al would join as well. And they were a group of three. I know their spot in the synagogue. I know their row in Shul. And that row will never be the same. He had a powerful commitment to his religion and to his people. He and Judy had a beautiful life together. They were incredibly dedicated to one another. I don't want to take anyone else's lines they're going to say, but they were a powerful unit together, unbelievably dedicated. If you went to the hospital to see him, you knew Judy would be there, because they were inseparable. They touched the lives of our community. They touched the lives of everyone in his here. They inspired us. We have learned from them. We will cherish his memory, and more importantly, hopefully, cherish the lessons in life that he taught us. Yehi zachru baruch. May his memory be a blessing. I'd like to call forward Ted's brother, Al. I want to talk to you <coughs> about my brother, my partner in life, Zachariah Tovia, to share both the, the gift that his life was to us and the pain that his passing brings. We, <coughs> we were brought up from a family of ten, four boys, four girls, and a father and a mother. We were tailors and farmers and we all worked very hard. Our home was always filled with love, love for each other and love of life. Zachariah, Ted, was very artistic and was always creating. We were on only 20 months apart 
we were inseparable, and we shared everything, friends and le lessons and life experiences together. There were so many things we loved doing as children, and one that stands out for me was skiing. We would all love to ski together on skis that we made. It was such a gift to be so free and have some, so much fun together on m mountains in Slovakia. Our lives drastically changed when the Nazi regime invaded our lives. And even in that horror, Ted and I were together throughout the awful experience of concentration camps Auschwitz and Buchenwald. Losing our family, we found hope and strength in each other, remembered the love and the strength that our parents instilled in us. And together we kept each other alive and we survived. We continued in life together as partners, moving to Cleveland raising our family and going to business together, creating a business of custom kitchen cabinets. I always looked up and admired Ted for his kindness and his gentleness and his positive outlook. He never had a bad word for, for or about anyone. He was very caring and friendly and had smiles for everyone. All our lives, we looked out for each other. My life feels a little empty right now. <laughs> and, and my heart is broken. I will miss my life. <laughs> I will miss the twinkles in his eyes. I will remember our parents' life lesson of the overwhelming love and shared to be strong and to be united in those memories. The Shimon should watch over all of us. The Harya are forever in my heart. I love you forever and always will. I'd like to call upon Ted's daughter, Mindy. Benjamin Disraeli said, the legacy of heroes is the memory of a great name and the inheritance of a great example. As a U.S. Army veteran, it is kind of fitting that his death occurred during the Memorial Day weekend. So when it is time to honor our fallen and the heroes of our country, I will also honor my dad. Although this quote from General George S. Patton referred to soldiers who died in the line of duty when he said, it is foolish to mourn them, I will embrace the latter part where he said, rather we should thank God that such men lived. I remember taking an undergraduate class for my family studies minor called Couple Relationships. And in the first lecture, the professor told us that girls marry their fathers. Well, that sounded pretty horrifying to a 19-year-old college student. I, I was reminded of this curious concept as I sat down to write this. And though it wasn't a conscious choice, it turns out that the guy I married is also a Capricorn and has some similar, similar qualities to my dad, who was a true Renaissance man, artistic, musical, and so handy that he could build or fix anything. I think it would be impossible to express exactly how special my dad was, but I suspect most of you already know that and explains why so many of you came here to pay your respects. This is a wonderful gesture or mitzvah that Ted can never repay to you, and I'm sure you will also know how deserving he was. Because really, 
He was the kindest, gentlest, generous, and most humble man I've known. I could go on to name 20 more positive characteristics that you'd agree describe him, but I'll let some of the other speakers address those. Instead of focusing on the bond I had with him, I will tell you that his model of selflessness taught me to share, and that is what I did so proudly with him, because he was too good not to share with others. For the last 30 years, I have relied on my dad's willingness to tell his Holocaust story, and he has been so generous. It began with coming to my college to speak at Miami University in 1987, and he'd probably done it a hundred times since then to varied audiences. In recent years, he came to Connecticut and visited all of my children's classrooms, some multiple times. And the last time he spoke was just a couple of months ago at my synagogue in March. And that was the day after he came out of the hospital. It isn't that he enjoyed sharing his Auschwitz experience, but he felt a responsibility for being able to help others bear witness. And he enjoyed the appreciation that came from being able to do this. He wasn't the most dynamic speaker, he was just the real thing. And those who heard him tell his story got that and always came away so grateful to have met him. We hope that my dad could go on being his generous, independent self for many more years. And it certainly looked like he was on track to do that. Unfortunately, his congestive heart failure was affecting his energy and we started down a path to fix that problem. And it only led to other problems that required additional surgical interventions despite what he endured with these six surgeries, the doctors were quite impressed with how well he recovered and his fight and his desire to live. One of the doctors teased him, asking if he was really 62 instead of 92. This got me thinking and I realized something. My dad always told us that April 11th, the day he was liberated from Buchenwald was his second birthday. But what I had not considered before was the year, 1945, which means he only turned 74 in April. This age seems more fitting. A nurse asked him what his secret was, and he pointed his finger up and said, God, he certainly had faith, and he was willing to endure whatever it took. Unfortunately, the age of his arteries caught up to him, and despite his valiant efforts and faith, we had to let him go. We lost a truly great one. And we also gained so much, so much from knowing him, loving him, watching him, and learning from him, as well as being the recipient of his many fixits or creative talents. I would be remiss not to say how lucky, proud, and honored all of his family, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, nieces, nephews, are to have had him in our lives. To know him was to love him, and boy, did we ever. We will miss him so much. And finally, I'd like to call upon Ted's granddaughter, Rosie, who's going to share some words. My name is Rose Faye Hirsch, granddaughter of Zygmunt Hirsch. I want to start by thanking everyone here for all the love and support from everyone during this time. Uh, we have some very special and amazing people here today to say goodbye to my papa. Uh, we have so much family here, family that all started from him and Nana. Recently, a few lines from a song stood out to me. Find your grandparents or someone of age, pay some respects for the path that they paved. To life they were dedicated, now that should be celebrated. And that's what we're doing here today. We're mourning a life, but we're also celebrating one too. I don't mean to brag, but I have some very amazing grandparents. Nan and Papa together made this family very close. For as long as I can remember, every other Friday night, we all gathered at their house for Shabbat meals that they cooked together. Aunts, uncles, cousins all came to Friday night dinners. My cousins and I were able to grow up together. 
Growing up, I thought all families were close like this. I had no idea some families lived states apart from their uncles and aunts, cousins, or hours away from their grandparents, or didn't have any at all. I'm so lucky to have always been surrounded by family. Because of the family they made, they created a support system for us to rely on each other, especially during these times. While we mourn today, we are mourning as a family and friends, not strangers. That is what Nana and Papa built for us, and that is the legacy he's leaving behind. As I said, Nana and Papa were a team in the kitchen. Unfortunately, I didn't get that good cook gene. Um, I actually burned water last week, um, literally. Uh, but Papa was an artist. He drew, sewed, painted. He was just good at that stuff. Thankfully, I inherited those genes. In fourth grade, my class embroidered matzah covers, which I gave to Nana and Papa for Seder. That was only the start. Around middle school, I started doing cross stitch and needlepoint. Papa was very supportive in that. He always loved to see what I made. When Jackie was pregnant with Violet six, almost seven years ago, I began making a quilt for baby Violet. I cross stitched baby animals on it. When it was finished, I was so excited, but the backside of it looked like a mess. The strings and the stitches all over the place, all unorganized. So I asked Papa if he could think of something to cover it. And sure enough, he bought some pink soft cloth and a pink ribbon and sewed the pink cloth on the back and bordered it with a pink ribbon. It was beautiful. Later that year, I thought about Papa telling me he had two birthdays, January 13th when he was born and April 11th, the day he was liberated from Buchenwald. So I worked for a month or two on a canvas. From what I recall, it had birds and birdhouses and flowers on it. And it said how important family is and I gave it to him for a second birthday because family was very important. There's so many things I'm going to miss about Papa, like coming over for dinner and having him teach me gin rummy. He would be so proud when I beat him and Nana by playing my cards right, or showing him my newest string art. I'm going to miss FaceTiming him and calling him while I'm at school. I will remember Papa as loving, caring, and supportive and always there whenever I needed him. Al, Mindy, and Rosie, thank you so much for sharing such heartfelt, beautiful memories and love. Your words penetrate our hearts. We feel the depth of your emotion. Our hearts go out to you and to the entire family. We pray that God should send comfort to all. Singbind, Hirsch, Ted, was a loving, devoted, caring husband to you, Judy, and a loving, devoted brother to you, Al, and a loving, caring, devoted father to you, Michael and Maureen, Kenny and Michelle, Alan and Ruth, Mindy and Ian, and Alyssa, And a proud, loving grandfather to you, Jeremy and Jackie, Laura and Ari, Naomi, Rosie and Haley, Corey and Darian, Aiden, Dustin and Julia. And such an incredibly proud great grandfather to Violet Sloan and Dresden. You all loved Ted in life. And now we're left to revere his memory in death. We pray that that memory always is a source of inspiration and guidance and comfort and strength and joy. I want to start by saying this is a very difficult eulogy for me to give. And I know for Rabbi Rudnuria when he gets up to speak, and I know for Rabbi Blau, and for Kander Schiffman, for all of us, difficult because Ted was so close with all of us. And we loved him dearly as a very, very precious friend. Ted was quiet, gentle, warm, loving and strong, generous, kind, patient and sweet. 
These are the words the family used as we gathered last night. And add to those words a fighter, a survivor. And also, I think it was Alan who said, a MacGyver type. As Mindy said, could fix anything, create anything, answer any need in any moment. Teg was born in Tibaba in Czechoslovakia, January 13th, 1927. You heard from Al about the loving home that they grew up in together with their siblings and their parents. Their father died before the war, and two children, Phil and Rose, were sent to the States so that they could make a living there and send back money to support the family. The rest of you, Al, you all went to school and then to Cheder together. Al, you told me that there was a lot of anti-Semitism even then, but also you had friends and life was good. And then the Hungarians came through an agreement with the Nazis. You were no longer allowed to go to public school, so your parents sent you to Catholic school. You were forced to wear the yellow stars. And then your family was taken away by the Nazis, first to a ghetto and then to Auschwitz. Your mother and two sisters perished in the gas chambers. You never saw them again. The two of you also became separated from Maury. But you and Ted managed to stay together through the entire terrifying nightmare of an experience. You helped and supported each other and gave each other strength. At one point, Al, you literally saved Ted's life. When they were picking out those that were not fit and strong enough to work. And you were afraid they would choose Ted because he was young. And you appealed to a Jewish couple that were involved in the process of selecting, working with the Nazis as some Jews were forced to do. And you begged them to spare him and through the entire experience in the camps, on the death march, the bonds between you grew ever stronger. You were in Auschwitz, then on an all-night march, nothing to wear, just a blanket to wrap around you. The morning came, the Nazis told you to lay down in a field. You didn't know what would happen, you thought they were going to shoot you. Then they loaded you all on cattle cars again. This time, open cattle cars. The snow was falling, feet of snow falling into the cattle car as it was driving. You were crowded with no room to move, nowhere even to take care of basic necessities and needs. They took you to Buchenwald. Eventually, from there, you were liberated by American forces. And after the war, the two of you returned to Tibaba, but you saw there was nothing really to return to. Others had taken everything. The house was being used for horses. You did manage to find some precious items, some gold, and I think also jewelry, a locket with a family photo that were hidden away in the wall by your family before they left. And with that little bit of extra value to take with, to be able to take care of yourselves, the two of you set off for Prague. There, Ted became a tailor, drawing upon his experience helping in the family business and his apprenticeship he had done with his uncle before the war, and Al, you started making jewelry. And once, I think it was in Prague, but I may be wrong, maybe it was before, you and Ted were walking on the street after the war, heading to a dinner sponsored by the community or some relief organization, when one of you 
looked across the street and said to the other, look, look at that man, isn't that? And it was, it was Maury. And miraculously, you were reunited with each other, all together again, an extraordinary thing. Ultimately, Phil and Rose, who were already here in the States, were able to bring you all here to the US, to Cleveland, though it took two years to get the visas. When you arrived in Cleveland, you each held various jobs that you tried to make ends meet, but you really didn't have a chance to settle in to the community here because not long after you arrived, you were both drafted into the army, and as we've already heard, you were both sent off to Korea, where you served overseas for at least a year. Al, you served in a MASH unit after getting some medical training in San Antonio. Ted served in an attachment dealing with office supply to two different branches of the military in Korea. It was a harrowing time. I can't even imagine surviving Auschwitz only to be thrown into the hell of war. Bob Zelwin, who serves as Gabai of our daily minion at B'nai Yashurim, shared with me that he once asked Ted and Henrik Sperling, a good friend, what that was like. Weren't they upset that they were drafted? How could they draft survivors? And Ted and Henrik both answered the same, that no, quite the opposite. They were honored to go. They felt such a debt to this country for liberating them and giving them a new life. And they saw their military service as a way to show their gratitude and to pay it back. Al, when the two of you came back from Korea, you joined together to open the cabinetry shop. You worked closely with each other and you were always together. You were an inseparable team in work, in life. Together you built up that shop until you had some 17 people working for you. And the two of you ran that cabinetry shop from 1957 until 2017, just two years ago. You made custom cabinets for builders and for private homes. And they were the finest cabinets made with precision, artisanship, and love. A look just at the cabinets in your own home, Judy, show the thoughtfulness with which he designed every piece. In your kitchen, the beautiful pull-out drawers, the use of even shallow wall space for making a cabinet, the beautiful bar with a hidden door that swings open, so many people in this community have cabinets from that cabinet shop in their homes and love and cherish them. Al, you and Ted were so very close. Growing up together, surviving the ravages of the Shoah, both going to Korea, building your business together, raising your families together. You even lived together in the same duplex you and your wife on one level, Ted and Judy on the other. You supported each other in everything. And if one of you did something the other thought was wrong or felt slighted, you always overlooked it because your love was too strong to let that stand in the way. Judy, you first met Ted in 1954. He saw you at a dance and he was totally taken by you. You did not see him there, but he called you up afterward to ask if he could see you. And you were not quite sure about that. You thought he was too old. After all, he was nine years older than you, and you no knew nothing about him. You were a little concerned if he was okay, if this was a safe thing to do. But he persisted, you agreed he could come to see you. You were living in a foster home at the time, and your foster mother checked him out and told you that he was okay. And when you met him, he was more than just okay. He was, you said, very quiet, very sweet, very good looking, and he had just come back from Florida, so he had this great suntan. You shared he also drove a beautiful Pontiac but you said it wasn't the car that made you swoon, it was the tan. 
He dated for two years before marrying on June 10, 1956. Ted proposed to you by slipping the engagement ring into your drink, and you were married at Belfair, where you had lived for a time, in the chapel by Rabbi Green. The reception was in the gym. Ted was a good husband, and Judy, the two of you enjoyed an extraordinary, close, loving relationship, bound tightly together in every aspect of life. He was so sweet and loving, and he especially liked cooking together with you in the kitchen. That was your special time, as Rosie said, cooking for Shabbat or for any occasion. And he was, the family said, a great sous chef. No one could peel a grapefruit like Ted could. And though Ted devoted endless long hours to building the business and providing for the family, he always managed to save time for you, his children, and grandchildren. He especially relished spending time with his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, the jewels in his crown. To his children, he even gave you haircuts. He was always there to help you and later your children with any school projects or anything that you needed. Mindy, you shared that when you wanted to improve your softball game, your dad put on an admit to play with you even though he didn't really know how. And if any of you had any kind of project that involved creating, inventing, or building, he was always there to help. He would come up with a wildly creative plan, but he didn't necessarily tell you what the plan was. He would just walk away and start working on it. He would get so involved, he would do it. And he was a perfectionist. And when it was finished, you always said, wow. So many extraordinary memories how he would paint the pool every year to get it ready for you, the tree house he built in the home next door to where, you ne where Judy and Ted now lived, Sundays visiting your relatives. Your mother and father taught you the importance of family, and Rose became the grandmother that you didn't have. Those wonderful family vacations, driving to Florida every winter and to the Catskills every summer, in the station wagon with no seatbelts in those days, sitting backwards. Ted made roof racks out of wood to hold the luggage on top of the car, and they only flew off once. The luggage flew all over. Like many survivors, for many years, Ted did not talk about the Holocaust. In fact, you shared that you were all used to seeing the tattoos on his arm and the arms of friends growing up but never had a real context for what it was. Until Mindy, you were a junior in high school and Al spoke at your school. It was the first time that you had heard your dad's story. And that led you to ask him to speak at your college, as you said. And the rest is history. His many, many times speaking through face-to-face -to, -face to different groups of students, speaking at congregations, sharing his story, bearing witness. There are so few survivors left to bear witness. Now there is one less. But there are hundreds of people who know the truth of the Holocaust because Ted shared his story. That too was one of the gifts that he leaves behind. And when Ted spoke, it was always without any notes, just from memory and from his heart. And he always held people's rapt attention and left them touched and changed by the encounter. He ultimately took all of you back to Europe to see where he grew up and the places where he endured his suffering. Mindy and Ian, he took you in 1994, Michael, Allen, and Kenny in 2007. These trips were a unique opportunity to learn about your father's experiences, but also to bond ever more closely with him. He was a great tour guide because he spoke so many languages. You went to Tibaba, which is in the middle of nowhere, and you wondered how it could be the Nazis would go out of their way to reach and harm such a small, isolated place. You got to see where the family lived and how they lived. Ted met someone he knew on the street there, and another woman he had known invited you into her home for Slivovitz, and the two shared stories from when they were in school together. You visited the cemetery where his father is buried, 
though it was overgrown with trees and weeds and littered with broken tombstones, unlike the beautiful Christian cemetery next to it. But Teg was able to say Kaddish there for his father. It was a very emotional moment for him. Most of all, you saw that nothing had really changed, and it helped you better understand your father's experience. Teg was an amazing grandfather who found such joy in all of you. As for his children, so for grandchildren, he was Mr. Fix-It. If you tore your jeans, he would sew them. Rosie, you once wore a flapper dress to a themed dance, a prom or some such thing, or homecoming, and the zipper was broken. You got the dress knowing that he'd fix that zipper for you. Judy, he even made the drapes in your home. And you wore the same dress to your daughter, Mindy and Ian's wedding, and to Kenny and Michelle's wedding, and between the two, Ted altered the dress, changing it so much that you would swear they were two different dresses. The grandchildren shared that if you said you liked his hat, he made you one. And he made Purim costumes for so many of you. Corey, he made you a Moses costume. For Rosie, it was Queen Esther. And a generation earlier, for Alan, it was a Haman's hat. Jeremy, you once had a project at school dealing with the French Revolution, and your papa made you a real working guillotine. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Miniature, not full size, but it worked. And Aiden, you once had a school project about inventing. And Ted came up with this idea to create a wire frame that would be a hanging holder for trash bags in the kitchen. He made it using just a hanger that would attach to a cabinet or drawer. And then there are four little indented loops so that you could take the handles of a plastic grocery bag and slip them over those corners, and voila. And you know what? They sell those now in the stores. I saw it in the house last night. It's a beautiful little invention. I said to Judy, it's too bad he didn't patent it. He made them first. He loves so much to spend his time with all of you. Jeremy and Laura remember apple picking in the fall. Dustin, you shared a memory of being in the kitchen watching with awe as your papa chopped vegetables so small. He saw you watching and he taught you how to do it. He used to take you all to the shop. And Rose, you shared I once went at the shop, you wanted to make a pencil box. He helped you make it out of wood. It was very beautiful, but you forgot to check the size of the pencils, and it was too small. <laughs> but it was so beautiful, you've kept it ever since anyway. And Julia Papa came to your home in Connecticut with stacks of wood and made you a big dollhouse for your American Girl dolls. And if anybody knows the size of an American Girl doll, we mean a big dollhouse. He put it together. He painted it. He furnished it just for you. Darian, you shared that your papa was the most kind person you ever knew and that you aspired to be like him. And I know that all the grandchildren feel that way. He always made time to be with you and to talk with you because you were the most important thing. And all of the spouses of Ted and Judy's children, and also of the grandchildren. They were just like Ted's own children and grandchildren. He loved each of you so much, embraced you, made you fully part of the family. And Jackie, you shared that it meant a great deal that they embraced you despite not being Jewish, and that you loved that they even became Judy and Ted close friends with your parents. 
And as each of you married into this family, you discovered what a gift it was to be a part of a family like this that is so close-knit and so loving, holds on so tight to each other. Laura, you shared how you used to love hanging out with Papa in his garden, eating his green beans right there, and how we used to hem your jeans back in the day when the style was for them to hang over the backs of the shoes, which he never understood. So he would pin them, and then you would say, no, Papa, longer. And then he would let a little bit more out, fabric out, and he would pin them again. He would say, no, Papa, longer, longer, until he would eventually make them just the way you wanted. He just wanted to make you happy. He just wanted to make all of you happy, to make everyone happy. That was the thing that gave him the most joy, was bringing happiness to those he loved and that he knew. And wow, how he loved his great-grandchildren especially his two precious girls, Violet and Sloane, and how he loved to see and hear about little Dresden. And he was excited that there's one more on the way. Violet shared with her mother that her favorite memory of Papa is Passover because she got extra huggies. She loved being with the family on Friday nights and coming over to paint together. And when Sloane was in town, she would be over every day. As Mindy said so beautifully, Teg was a true Renaissance man who could do everything. He was a self-learner. He was extraordinary craftsman, an artist, a musician, and more. He started crafting things at a very young age, as Al said, making skis and sleds. They couldn't buy toys, so they made them. And then when you got to this country, Al continued to teach himself, learning how to do engineering drawings for the cabinetry. He was very skilled with wood. He made beautiful cabinets and could make beautiful furniture. He made a number of items for our synagogue and also repaired many pieces when they would become damaged. Once, Ruth, you mentioned to him that you needed a cutting board. And he said, don't buy it, I'll make it for you. And he did make an extraordinarily beautiful cutting board with alternating strips of maple, oak, and cherry, a stunning piece. And then it turned out that you had a client, a casino in Vegas, that needed a really beautiful cutting board for a commercial they were making, and you said, I have the perfect one. So Ted's cutting board was on TV. And I have to add also that I have this beautiful dining room set in my home. Those of you from my congregation have heard me talk about this because I've talked about it in sermons how much it meant to me to have my grandmother's dining room set because I grew up around that table and chairs. But one of my great frustrations is that the arms of the two chairs that had arms just kept breaking off because the wood was so old and brittle. And I had, many years ago, several times tried taking it to various furniture restorers and paying a lot of money to have the arms restored only to have them snap off again a few days or a week later. And when I would go back and talk to the furniture makers, they would say, the wood is just too brittle. You can't make it stay. So for many years, we lived with the arms off. And then one day I said to Ted, you know, all these years we've never tried again to fix these arms because they never seem to last. Do you think you could do anything? Like that, the same day he was at my house to pick up the chairs. He insisted on carrying them to the car himself, wouldn't let me carry them. A few days later, they were back. He carried them into the house. They were perfect. You couldn't even see where they were broken. And they've lasted ever since, strong as can be. Teg was a deeply religious man who had a very personal relationship with God and had a rich prayer life and was deeply devoted to tradition. There is a story floating around the family, though Judy doesn't remember it, that when they were expecting their fourth child, Ted really wanted a daughter, 
He already had three sons, and they went to a rabbi for a blessing. When Minnie was born, they were so grateful that she was a girl that they started keeping kosher, joined Greed Road Synagogue, and sent Minnie and Alan to Hebrew Academy. In later years, they also joined B'nai Sherman, coming back to their earlier home. Al, you and Ted and other members of your family were members of B'nai Sherman from when you first arrived in Cleveland. Friday night, Judy, you and Ted would host many Shabbat dinners, as we've already heard, with the family and also inviting over various friends or other people from the community and children and grandchildren love looking forward to the surprise guests each Shabbat. Ted always led the family seders. And he started coming to Minyan 20 years ago when his sister Rose died and he never stopped. He is in our morning Minyan six days a week. And Shabbat, he is either at Green Road or the few Shabbats he isn't, he's at B'nai Shurim. A day never went by that he was not in Shul. He would sit towards the back in the morning Minyan and would welcome every newcomer to the Minyan. He was friends with everyone and took a personal interest, not just in the other Minyanaires, but also in their families, always asking about them and keeping track of their family members and their children. He very often would lead the davening. His Hebrew was perfect and his voice had a sweet, lilting quality to it. I loved when he davened. It was so very beautiful. But he would daven fast, much as the family shared when he would say the prayers Friday night. He would recite them so fast it was hard to follow and keep up. Davening gave him a great sense of peace and joy. It was his way of every day thanking God for saving him from the Shoah and for the gifts in his life. Judy, you and Ted were very active in Kol Israel and in a couples club, and he so enjoyed being commander of post 14 of the Jewish war veterans. He loved art, and when he retired, he took up classes at Tri-C, and like everything else that he put his hands to, he had great success. His paintings are beautiful, and Judy, you've given them to your children to put up in their homes. In fact, at one point, he used to go to Minyan, then to the art studio, then bowling. This was like fairly recently, not 20 years ago. Ted also loved animals. And there were various pets and dogs that were part of the family over the years. So the dogs always had to be outside. He loved to scoop up bunnies in the backyard and even a deer that was born at your house. There's a picture of him lovingly holding it. And he loved gardening. He had a huge garden and he would share his vegetables with friends and neighbors. Ted was also an amazing self-taught musician. He played the harmonica, the accordion, the piano, the trumpet, and of course the shofar. In fact, he played the shofar in our shul, blowing it every single morning in the month of Elul every year to call us to repentance and to prepare our souls and our hearts for the coming new year. He played by ear. The harmonica was his favorite. He played the harmonica going back to his childhood before the war. And he also loved listening to cantorial music. Judy, whenever the two of you traveled long distances, road trips and such, when he drove, you would listen to tapes of Cantor's music. When you drove, he would play the harmonica. I want to say a word about Ted as a chauffeur blower. Because our minion just won't be the same this coming Elul without him sounding the ram's horn. The halakha says that a chauffeur blower must be someone who is pure in spirit and who lives a life of humility. Someone whose heart, like the shofar, is inclined towards heaven. And that was Ted the most humble guy you could ever meet. Always thinking of everyone else first, always looking after everyone else, always giving of his time. At Minyan breakfast, everyone would gather around the table where the schnapps was to make lechayim, but not Ted, because he would rush to go over to get the coffee ready and pour coffee for everyone. And Julie Abrams, of blessed memory, would see that Ted was pouring coffee and not joining them. He'd say, Ted, Ted, get over here. 
and pull Ted over so they can make the Lechayim. And after Julie passed away, it became the custom at our minion that that's how we begin our Lechayim over schnapps after minion. We gather on the schnapps table, we hold up our schnapps glasses, and we say, Ted! Then we make the bracha. Can't make the bracha without saying Ted. And the minion is still doing that. And have pledged to keep doing that every day forever in memory of Ted. In Pirkei Avot, we read, Ezehu Ashir, who was rich, he was satisfied with this portion. And that was Ted. He never chased after money or status. He was never envious of what others had. He was just happy, happy with his life, grateful to be alive, thankful for his family and friends and community. He saw the good in every person, the possibility in every moment. He saw only love. And he gave that love to everyone that he saw and to everyone that he knew. His heart was full. I want to say to all of you, the family, that I know these past weeks, months have been torture so difficult surgery after surgery each time hopes raised that this would be the time he would move forward we kept thinking this is the time we're going to get him back at Minyan and then another crisis more fear more challenges more suffering for Ted he was a fighter and he wanted to live and he wanted to be here and as many said in the end, it was too much. And Ted knew in the end that it was God's decree. He knew it was time to go. He let you know that, that he was ready to go. Sad to leave all of you, but ready to go. And now he is at peace, at one with his creator reunited with his beloved parents and other family members who've gone before, sharing in the light of the righteous and the great reward God has in store for the most noble of us. What an extraordinary gift all of you were to him during these difficult months. How you stood by him and cared for him Judy, you never left his side. You slept in the hospital room. You refused to go anywhere. You and your children chased after doctors and nurses, struggled over every decision to do what was right, made sure he got the absolute best care, and that every possibility was taken to give him life. And then when it was clear that saving him wasn't possible. Judy, you gave him the greatest gift of all, allowing him to leave with dignity and honor and peace surrounded by his entire family. All of you there together, children and grandchildren, stroking his cheek, kissing him, telling him how much you loved him, sharing the memories of the times that you spent with him and the ways in which he touched your lives and the ways in which he will live in your life in the future. It was deeply beautiful to watch. Sad to lose an extraordinary giant, but beautiful to see the way his values live on in each of you. Ted was a craftsman, but the greatest thing he crafted was this family. And just like everything else, he had a plan. Maybe you didn't know it, maybe you did, but he had a plan. The plan was 
to live in such a way, to draw you together with each other and with your other relatives in such a way that you would know that family was the single most important thing in the world and that you would become so tightly entwined with each other that you could never imagine yourselves being apart. That you would find your greatest joy in family and see family as the greatest value. That's a great legacy. And he crafted this family in a way that taught you what it means to fight and to survive, to overcome obstacles. And he crafted this family in a way that taught you what it means to be devoted to tradition, to love Judaism, and Torah, and community, to value friends. And most of all, despite all of the darkness that Ted went through in his early years, he taught you the power of love to live your life satisfied with what you have and always wanting to give before you receive, to share your love with others and to bring joy into the world around you. That is the greatest gift of all. And through those gifts, Ted will always live on in each one of you. May his memory always be for a blessing. May you always feel his presence. And we say, Amen. I have to call upon Rabbi Rudin Noria. Ted made us all better. Ted gave each of us a gift. He taught us what it meant to be a mensch. I will miss him. I loved him. He was a friend, and he was a teacher. May his memory always bring blessings. Amen. Well, rises Kanner Shipman leads us in the memorial prayer. Shochein Bameromim Hametzem and Nuchanechonam Tahad Kanafei Yashachina Bimahalor Kedoshim Tahorim Kizohar Harakia Mazirim Edishmad Zahaya Tubim Chaim Yehuda Vesara Shalach Leolamo Begun Eden Tehei Menuchato Ahana Shalom Exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure. To the soul of our beloved Zygmunt Ted Hirsch, Zachar Yatuva ben Chaim Yehuda, who has gone to his eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that our loved one find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life. May he merit the reward from living a life filled with righteousness, filled with kindness, 
filled with love. May he leave us a Zacharia Tuvia, a sweet memory, a good memory, living up to that name which he did. May he rest in peace and let us say, Amen. Interment will follow at Zion Cemetery, after which the family will gather for Shiva at Judy and Ted's residence, 23423 East Baintree Road in Beechwood. And today, following services through 8.30 p.m. and Wednesday, no. Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m with Minion at 7 p.m. Friends who wish may contribute to the Cole Israel Foundation or any Holocaust education program. Please remain standing. 